Hi, Lagim fam. Just to get you excited about our new season, here is a Patreon episode that was published a couple of months ago for my Patreon subscribers. It is a much requested case in general, so I thought I'd publish this as a bonus hiatus episode. Hope you enjoy it. This is the story of Lucila Lalu. When I first read about Lucilla, I realized that she very much embodied that lady boss, girl boss vibe that a lot of women show in their social media these days. The only difference is that Lucilla did not have social media because she lived in the Philippines in the 1960s. Lucilla Tolentino Lalu came from humble beginnings in Barrio Mapanique in Candaba, Pampanga. I reckon she already had a lot of drive in her youth because at some point, and we do not know at what age exactly, Lucila made her way to Manila in search for greener pastures. In the nation's capital, she first worked as a waitress in a small bar and became known to her bosses and colleagues as someone who was good with money management. Lucila saved up her money religiously, and at some point, she had saved just enough to establish not one, but two businesses. She had a salon called Lucy's House of Beauty, and she also owned Pagoda, a restaurant and cocktail lounge and nightclub. Stories about her would estimate her to be in her mid to late 20s when she started her business ventures, which is, in all fairness, very impressive given that she was a young woman in the 60s. Around the same time, Lucila's love life also seemed to be seeing some good days. She met a police officer named Aniano de Vera and quickly fell in love. The only thing that was worrying about Lucila's new boyfriend was that he was married, but it looked like Lucila did not really mind. They started living together as much as Aniano's marital commitments permitted, and soon enough, the both of them were essentially in a common law marriage, as in both people accept that they are together as a couple without the formal and legal recognition of the law in the land. This made sense because if they had decided to legally marry, well, that would have made Aniano a bigamist, something that is punishable under Filipino law. Aniano and Lucilla eventually became parents when Lucilla was just 28 years old, and she gave birth to the couple's first and only child. Impressively, Lucilla seemed to have been able to balance family and work life just fine, and continued to thrive in her business and as a mother. But all that came to a grinding halt when Lucilla suddenly disappeared one summer day in May of 1967. Initially, it is not clear whether her family reported her missing right away because it was known even back then that Lucilla had at least one lover and would regularly spend time with them. One man she had an affair with was a waiter at her business establishment, the Pagoda Soda Fountain. His name was Florante Relos. We'll get back to him later. Meanwhile, on the 28th of May, police officers in Santa Cruz, Manila, were called to attend something that a rubbish collector had discovered on Malabon Street. Upon arriving at the scene, the police were horrified to see that the rubbish collector found human body parts, specifically a woman's pair of legs, cleanly cut in four pieces, wrapped in a newspaper dated May 14th, 1967. When the police interviewed the rubbish collector, he told them that he touched the body parts and noticed that they were cold to touch, as if they had just been taken out of a freezer. 
Furthermore, the police, as well as the rubbish bin collector, noted that the toes of whoever these body parts belonged to were well pedicured, hinting at the person probably being well off than your average Filipina, or at least that was the presumption back then. The police initially assumed that the legs found were a match to a severed hand found mere days earlier. However, upon further examination, the medical examiner concluded that the decomposition rates on the legs were very much different to those on the hand, and so they opened up a new investigation. Nearly a day later, a torso with its arms still attached was found along Edsa Avenue near the Guadalupe Bridge. Again, these parts were wrapped in newspaper as well, but the paper was dated 23rd of May, 1967. The police, seeing as the hands were still well-preserved, proceeded to obtain their fingerprints. The tedious task of comparing these fingerprints to those on their file had officially started. Eventually, the police found a match. It was Lucilla's. Her prints were on file when she applied for a police clearance back when she first arrived in Manila. So now that the police had a name, they were focusing on who could have done this to her. Whether that someone was a family member, a friend, or acquaintance, the police were convinced that they were looking for someone who was skilled with the knife and who had a degree of medical knowledge owing to the fact that Lucilla's body parts were very precisely cut. Before I move on to the next bit, there is one last detail that I would like to share, and that is the rumor that perhaps Lucilla was one month pregnant when she was killed. This detail is widely disputed. Some reports mention this and some do not. And so this remains a mystery within a mystery. Now on to the early investigation phase of the police. The police initially posited that Lucilla's killer must have had access to a huge freezer and a vehicle since they believed that her body parts were initially frozen before being dumped and scattered in different parts of the city. And so the police rounded up some potential suspects, and a lot of them were, quite honestly, Lucilla's alleged lovers. The first man to be questioned was someone that I've already mentioned before. His name was Florante Relos, who was a 19-year-old waiter at the Pagoda, the restaurant and cocktail bar owned by Lucilla. When he was questioned, Florante said that he could not have been the one who killed Lucilla because he had an alibi. He said he was drinking with his friends at the time Lucilla had apparently died. He also explained to the police that it did not make a lot of sense to kill Lucilla because she essentially provided for him and rented out an apartment for him in Cubao. The police then wanted to verify his story and started asking the people who worked at the pagoda about what they knew about Relos's relationship with Lucilla. One cashier said that she believed that the two lovebirds had actually broken up. She also revealed to the police that on the night when Lucilla disappeared, she told Relos and his buddies where Lucilla was and that she was possibly at her beauty salon. Now, it seems like they may have asked her where Lucilla was at that point, but the reports that I have read were not clear about this, and it seemed like this disclosure by the cashier to the police was taken out of context. Other witnesses who were also questioned by the police revealed that they were sure they saw Florante Relos and his friends drag Lucilla into a cab in front of the beauty salon. Now, there is one tiny problem with these eyewitness accounts. They were never actually verified by the police, which seems odd to me because surely this was a good first lead into the murder. And if that ended up becoming their only lead, they would have needed to verify it one way or another. However, they didn't. 
The police then went on to their next suspect instead, who was Lucilla's common law husband, Aniano de Vera. Now, it was known in the community that the couple had problems. The problems were not extreme, but they were bad enough for the couple to send their only child to live with Lucilla's mother in Caloocan. On top of that, Aniano had a temper. He was the angry and jealous type. And all that would have still been fine, but Aniano was also a trigger-happy person, having discharged his service weapon inside Lucilla's business establishments just a mere month before she disappeared and was found dead. And so the police had to question him. Aniano told the police officers that he remembered having dinner with Lucilla the night of her disappearance. They were both at Lucilla's beauty salon, and it was around 6.30 in the evening. He said that after dinner, he left right away. Witnesses would later share with the police that they, in fact, saw Lucilla sleep in the salon, which kind of aligns with what the cashier said when she was interviewed at the Pagoda nightclub. However, this does not prove anything. It neither proves that Aniano did anything to Lucilla, nor does it prove that Florante Relos and his buddies did anything to her. So, as it stood, the police had two non-starters as leads, and nothing to verify either of these accounts. But the police kept looking and found a third suspect. He was an executive at a printing firm who was suspected to have been another of Lucilla's lovers. His name was never made public in any of the reports, by the way. The police honed in on him because of a cardboard material used in wrapping newsprints that was found underneath Lucilla's torso. However, upon further investigation, the police did not pursue this specific lead because this mystery printing firm man had a watertight alibi for the night of Lucilla's disappearance. Which brings us to our last and rather bizarre suspect. Jose Luis Santiano was a 28-year-old dentistry student who came forward in June 1967 because of his quote-unquote guilty conscience and how it told him to come forward. When the news broke out about his confession, it caused a bit of a stir. He was a handsome man, married, father of five, and the son of a retired colonel. Santiano claimed that he was one of Lucilla's many lovers and was also one of the room occupants in her beauty salon where she had a few spare rooms. Now, at the beginning, it did not make sense to me why he would rent from her, but I sort of thought that maybe he was originally from the province, from the countryside, and he needed a room whilst being away from his family meaning his wife and five children. But this is, of course, just an assumption that I have made. His account went something like this. Lucilla had apparently tried to seduce him the night of her disappearance, but he refused. This bit of information could potentially verify what the witnesses from near the salon said about how Lucilla slept in the salon that night. Maybe Santiano was also there. In any case, Santiano refused her advances and Lucilla became angry. She threatened to create a scandal, perhaps by telling his wife and father about his affair with her, but this is just my own speculation. He then said that he lost his mind. He had a blackout. He then started strangling Lucilla until she died. He then needed to dispose of her, and thought it best to dismember her with a knife and razor blade. After he was done with this horrific act, he carried her parts around the city in paper bags and boxes whilst commuting in taxis and jeepneys to ensure that Lucilla's body parts were scattered all around the metro. Now, a tiny sidebar here. I've read a few comments on forums and blogs and on YouTube 
about how people were so confused that Santiano refused the advances made by Lucilla, which caused her to become angry, which caused him to become angry. And the only thing I would like to say to that is a person is allowed to refuse their own lover's advances. And so this is nothing outrageous or nothing new. Sometimes you're just not in the mood. Sometimes you just want to have some peace and you can say no to your partner. And I'm hoping that this is what happened here. But of course, this story is far from over. So the police naturally were shocked to hear this story, this confession made by Santiano, but they still needed to verify his account. And so they checked his room at the beauty salon and eventually found dried blood underneath his bed, where he said he kept the body for a short period before disposing of it. He then added that Lucila's head was thrown away in the Liman Quezon city. This was never found. And that should have been it, really. But it was not. Not by a long shot, as it turned out. Three days after Santiano confessed, he retracted his whole confession, saying that he was in fact not the murderer the police had been looking for. Instead, Santiano said that he was an unwilling witness to the murder. According to him, Lucilla was killed by three men. She was killed in the mezzanine of the beauty salon. Specifically, Santiano said that two of the three men killed Lucilla, whilst the third one was holding him hostage at gunpoint. A fourth man appeared the following morning to apparently plant evidence in Santiano's room to set him up. This was the dried blood that was then found underneath his bed. Over the next few days after the murder, he allegedly received notes threatening him to stay silent. However, the police were having none of that. They did not believe him. For them, it was clear that Santiano had murdered Lucila Lalu. They found not only the dried blood under his bed, but also a hammer with bloodstains right there in the mezzanine. The knife was also there, as well as the razors, just as Santiano had said in his initial confession. From the police's perspective, Santiano was only retracting because he was able to talk to his lawyers, therefore implying that the lawyers were coaching him. But here's the kicker. The inspection of his room at the beauty salon did not actually happen until after Santiano had retracted his confession. Before that, the police did not deem it important to inspect his room. From my point of view, it seemed like the police were rather negligent. And by doing so, they were jeopardizing Lucila's murder investigation, but also... Santiano's freedom. The Philippine National Police were eventually forced to pass Lucila's case to the NBI at the behest of the prosecutor in charge because he was very unimpressed with the police's work. The evidence, according to him, was unconvincing. I can only imagine that the negligence by the police also did not help the prosecutor's mood. And so the National Bureau of Investigation stepped in. They placed Santiano in their custody and started their investigation. Whilst the investigation was ongoing, the NBI received many a death and bomb threats from people who were clearly in support of Santiano and who wanted to see him being released. Eventually, and sadly perhaps, the NBI did release him after they had investigated the case. The reason for this release is still unclear to this day, but it could possibly have something to do with a woman named Dr. Nora L. Ebio. Back then, she was a bit of a mystery witness. According to her, PNP or Philippine National Police Investigator Sergeant Ildefonso Labao allegedly coerced Santiano into confessing to the crime back in June 1967. 
She claimed that when his room was finally checked for evidence, after Santiano retracted his confession, the door from the looks of it was found to have been forced open, implying somehow that someone may have broken into the room to plant evidence. So, in my mind, there are two ways to interpret this statement made by Dr. Ebbio, and these two interpretations are essentially two sides of the same coin. So, the first side of this coin. Is she saying that the door was forced open by this perhaps fourth man who Santiano had mentioned was part of the murder crew who killed Lucilla? The fourth man, as you may remember, was apparently there to plant evidence to set him up so that he would take the blame for Lucilla's death. Now, the second interpretation or deduction that I can make from what Dr. Ebbio had stated back in the 1960s is that perhaps the police were the ones who forced themselves into Santiano's room to plant the evidence there to set him up, but also ultimately to cover up for their negligence in this investigation for the fact that they have not been thorough and were now in trouble with the prosecutor and perhaps with the greater public. Again, these are just my interpretations and deductions and speculations as to what Dr. Nora had said when she became this mystery witness for the case. I am just dumbfounded that the police did not think it should be first priority to really go through the premises of their strongest suspect to really go there and gather forensic evidence to prove that he was the murderer and to strengthen the prosecutor's case. The Lucila Lalu case would become one of the longest running cold cases in the Philippines. After 1967, Lucila's brutal death slowly faded into the back of everyone's minds. They were on to the next sensationalized, horrible crime on primetime news. But in 2003, a new generation of true crime loving Filipinos would be rattled awake by a revelation that seemed too good to be true. A former Los Angeles police detective published a book about Elizabeth Short, better known as the Black Dahlia, an inspiring actress from Boston, Massachusetts, who relocated to California in 1946. Her name would be propelled to the front pages of every newspaper and tabloid in the U.S., after her mutilated remains were found in the neighborhood of Leimert Park in 1947. She was only 22 years old. Steve Hodel, the retired detective, detailed in his book that he had conducted a very thorough investigation that took him 15 years to conclude. He came to the conclusion that his father, George Hodel, had likely killed Elizabeth Short. George Hodel came under suspicion at the time of Elizabeth's murder, but he was never formally charged. Now, how does this connect with Lucilla's case? According to Steve Hodel, three years after Elizabeth had been murdered, his father, fled to the Philippines and stayed there from 1950 to 1990, even getting married to a high-society Filipina named Hortensia Laguda, who would later go on to serve as a congresswoman in the House of Representatives in the Philippines. Steve Hodel believes that his father was behind Lucilla's murder as well because it fits his M.O., that is, if one also believes that George killed Elizabeth Short. Furthermore, George Hodel was in Manila at the same time as Lucilla was. In Manila, he had become a successful international marketing expert. He would have had the financial resources and material resources, like a freezer, to pull off an elaborate murder to drive the parts around Manila and make sure that his identity is kept hidden for years to come. If this was true, and that's a big if, 
George Hodel must have either known Lucilla personally or she must have been a victim of opportunity, much like Elizabeth Short probably was. Sadly, and as it stands, Lucilla's case has never been solved and it is officially still an open case. Now, for a case that is more than half a century old, it is likely to remain a cold case forever. Before I end this episode, here's another sidebar thought. When I was reading up on this case, I found the digitalized newspaper clippings from the late 60s, and they were rather salacious in their coverage of Lucilla's case. The fact that she was this fiercely independent woman who took on lovers on the side was excellent tabloid fodder. I wonder now if this mentality perhaps bled through to the police investigation. Did they not do their best because they thought she had it coming? I can only speculate, of course. I would not be surprised, though. Post-colonial Philippines is very much influenced by Catholic values. Notice I'm saying Catholic and not just Christian. There is a lot of shame and guilt associated with being an unapologetic woman who is young, ambitious, apparently perhaps promiscuous. But with men, having mistresses left and right is just so normalized, even in the Philippines. Slut-shaming and victim-blaming are alive and well in Filipino society, and it would not surprise me at all if the police back then had been dismissive of Lucilla and the fate she had met at the hands of her murderer. Patreon fam, thank you so much for being so patient whilst I was producing this episode. I was finally able to record this episode after putting myself on vocal rest, The wet weather here in the UK is truly not doing me any favors, but I'm thankful to have my voice back. Thank you again for all your support and make sure to keep your eyes peeled for your bonus episodes this month. Keep safe, marami salamat at mabuhay.